Hi everybody, I'm Rupert Allen. I'm a member of the Missing Maps movement. And uh, I'm here today to tell you about a technology that's used for social and humanitarian interventions to create information from communities about uh, how they're excluded from services, uh, what situations they're in in disasters and emergencies. But I want to propose that we have all got something to learn from this in the longer term. Uh, and I'd like to uh, talk a little bit more about why that is. Um, a little bit about me. I uh, am an MSF technical logistician. So I'm the guy who figures out how to put a hospital into the desert, how to keep vaccines cool in very hot places, how land cruisers or boats manage to get people in or out of danger or planes. Um, I know how people behave with physical technology on the ground in the field. This is uh, a technology that came new to me with a very little digital background. We're all a bit afraid of the digital revolution. It's quite closed, it's quite strange, and we feel excluded from it by big corporations. I was just exactly the same as that. Um, but this is something that takes the digital and puts it into a physical, activated role very, very viscerally. Um, I got a call one day from the Missing Maps movement saying they needed somebody who knew the field to go and uh, to map a load of victims of HIV in an illegal or informal dwelling in Southeast Africa. I learned very quickly, I didn't even have a smartphone then, I learned very quickly how to use it and how we would uh, try and prepare for this and went there and did it. Uh, the Missing Maps movement is something that leverages uh, open street map as a common resource that's open to everybody and people can upload to the map and create an information system that's available to all. It's something that has a login like Facebook, you have a profile, it's a worldwide community and open street map has millions of users doing cycle maps and green mapping, doing all sorts of applications of how this map can be. You can publish it, you can take and make maps and sell them. It's an open source resource. In 2006, it having been invented in 2002 as a wiki map. Imagine a wiki map where you can go in, you can update and you can edit your own information. You own the map as a member of this community. There is no one in charge except for the society, the movement itself around missing maps and open street map. Uh, in 2006, this map was first used in Haiti in disaster response. Nobody knew where people were. The flooding from the hurricanes and the destruction was making it extremely hard to take care of people with typhoid and cholera. Water was mixing. People were getting infected. Somebody on the ground from MSF downloaded the map, updated it, and put it back online. Somebody elsewhere could see where, where they were, where the people were, how close they were to stuff, how difficult it was, and what stuff that was that they were close to. It was used in 2010 in the earthquake in Haiti again. 2015, OpenStreetMap community were activated in Kathmandu one dark day when the earthquake hit. Before anyone hit the ground, Missing Maps had got in touch with OpenStreetMap community members and participants and built a map within three days, a brand new map of exactly where everything had been before the earthquake. And this was used by all the aid organizations as an interventional map. It's an extremely rapid system. The way it works is that mapathons exist. Remote volunteers trace satellite imagery. They have its socially organized events and take their mapping back home. This is not an observation talk. This is about participation here. I struggled to understand how much I was part of it as soon as I signed up. But given that no one is in charge, we are all taking responsibility. There are 100,000 people in the Missing Maps movement alone, the humanitarian side of OpenStreetMap. And we all own data together. We represent excluded populations and we also protect them we make sure that we don't expose too much it's a it's what i like to call the world's biggest art collaboration people all over the world do it and the focus on certain disaster areas is contained within these mapathons so we can be very incisive Google Maps is not there in these places there's an assumption that you can just get Google Maps out 
most of Africa and in fact most of the world is completely blank on Google Maps. We all assume living in the world that we're in or when we go on holiday there are tourist commercial ventures that have been mapped. In these places, Google aren't interested in the commercial element. There's no money to be made. So you go there and there is no map. Now, when you go to certain areas, you will find an extremely intricate map of that place. Uh, if we've been there, if we've been mapping. We use donated satellite imagery and we trace over it one by one. Lines, points and shapes. Houses, roads, trees, features, telephone masts. Then what we do is we, we hit the field and we don't map it ourselves, we activate the local community with whatever technology they've got, we will shapeshift into that community. Most of sub-Saharan Africa has got smartphones. You don't have to have a smartphone to add values to that data, but it helps. I'm going to take you as an example into northern Uganda. In 2017, a massive refugee influx happened from South Sudan where there was violence. And suddenly, an environment that was being run by the UNHCR, High Commissioner for Refugees, and had been for years taking refugees from Tanzania, from Rwanda, from Ethiopia, even from Senegal, and giving them a self-sufficient plot that they could survive by farming and having their own existence quite happily, this coordination was completely overwhelmed. And suddenly they realized they didn't know where to put everybody because everybody had lists of where people were, but none of it was visualized. Now, data is just data. It's just numbers. It's boring, really boring. I can't stand it. I can't stand coding. I can't stand any of that nonsense. It's all just completely opaque to me. But these are visual images of how far people are from certain things. You can round them up. You now know if you've got a 1,000 houses with 2.6 average population in that are three kilometers from a police station in a precarious situation where there's a cultural difference going on, you've got a potential problem arising. And it's all about the imagery. These are the settlements in northern Uganda and the whole of Uganda, in fact. We focus on the northern settlements. And here's a great example of what data you can get once you've gone out on the ground and mapped it. The UNHCR are getting reports that the refugees who seem privileged to the local community there and are getting aid and assistance uh, are getting into violent um, situations with local people. 80% of the population that are migrating into northern Uganda are women and children. So there's a big problem with sexual and gender-based violence, for instance. What happens is that the focus of this happens around latrines and boreholes where women and children have to go and collect water at night. So we put lighting on these boreholes. If you know there's lighting on a borehole, it's fine. But if you know that there are 5,221 that don't have lighting as opposed to your 3,152 that do, and exactly where they are, and how far they are from health centres, how far they are from police protection, and how close they are to the border, which you see in the left of this image between a settlement and the rural community outside, you know where to focus your resource allocation. You know where those dollars that everybody talks about, where, you know, the mismanagement of funds, you know where they're all going because you've got a map that's getting reported on by local people using their smartphones, reporting and using their tools, the local one, WhatsApp. It's all coming into your map and you can update your map all the time. So, a million and a half refugees in northern Uga in Uganda overall. There's an environmental time bomb as well, and we can map the forest areas that are depleting. We can find a T-minus day if they continue to burn wood so they can sanitize water to prevent disease, so that they can cook food in order to eat. Then we know that on a certain date, at the current rate, they are going to run into a whole load of problems. We can predict disasters, and we can preempt them. Um, there's also a lot of... Um, um, there are a lot of organizations collecting data, but it's not going on to one map. There are proprietary maps. Open street map means you can contribute all of the data to that map, and everybody can share their information together. So we do trainings. We train local people. Some of them have never seen a computer or used a computer before. We, we, we get them logins, and then we... we send them out into the community with smartphones after we've selected them. They're now collecting surveys, asking questions, and we're using WhatsApp to, to coordinate these guys. 
they head into these refugee settlements. Now, OpenStreetMap can map absolutely anything, and I'm going to come to that shortly. But for this, the disaster response is split into sectors. We have wash, water and sanitation and hygiene. It's all about those boreholes. Everybody needs water. Everybody needs sanitation. If a sanitation point, a latrine, is close to a borehole and the rains come, it floods and people get infected water. If the health care is far from population or there aren't any doctors, often there are more than 100 students to a teacher in schools there. We ask these questions. How many teachers? How many pupils? Are there latrines in the school? If there aren't, then what happens? Young women can't go to school because they're excluded for certain purposes. If there aren't any uh, doctors in the hospital, then we can't treat certain diseases. If there's no power, we can't have live vaccines there. So people might have to walk for miles. And we can look at that and address this with the millions of dollars that aid money, of aid money that do flow in. But they need, if they get better managed, then they can, uh, they can be used more transparently. And we know the last mile of where those dollars end up. The cash-based interventions, the CBI marketplaces are very important so that we can know where people are gathering and if there's, a, there's an outbreak, then diseases get transmitted in those areas. The secret weapon that we use as well as the local techniques that people have and the local apps that they're using, so smartphones and WhatsApp, is motorbikes. All over Africa, there are motorbike networks. There are chapters of these riders. We use their local knowledge, their geographical uh, understanding of the surroundings, so there's no duplication. We use their um, network of supplies, and we use their duty of care. They have a professional duty to make sure that, and on a system, to make sure that they take care of the surveyors that we've trained. And sometimes they even become surveyors themselves. These guys have got a mobile infrastructure which actually far outstrips our old-fashioned copper-wired, hard-wired, bureaucratic system. And we have got quite a lot to learn from this, this ability to mobilize and stay mobile and stay connected. The other thing that motorbikes can do is charge phone batteries. So we've got an infrastructure there that's a power system. It's a whole different way of looking at life what we can do with this really informal, cobbled together information is, as long as we know we've got absolutely every single point from the community, and it's in their interest to give us those points and to represent their, their own needs to us, so we know we've got locally important points in every single location. We can do some serious analytics. How many boreholes are non-functional? Uh, yeah, okay, there might be boreholes there and they get overlooked because nobody's taking a survey on whether they're working or not. Who's responsible for them? Who installed them? We can go to certain organizations and bring them and call them to account. We can look at the difference between inside and outside a settlement. Contaminated water in a rural place on, on one side and a water hole that maybe people from the outside go but run it dry on the inside. So we've got different problems that the different communities start to understand each other because they're working together and don't forget everybody's got their login everybody's understanding each other's problems and we've got social cohesion between communities on the ground and communities in those places in london and berlin and new york where people are making those maps they're working shoulder to shoulder we take those maps back we check the data we make sure people are participating they understand why they're important and they start changing things the younger generation get to see how to use it and the maps show us certain things. So I take this map, one of the first maps we did. In 12 weeks, we mapped uh, 8,500 points in a Rua district in northern Uganda. These are the water points. We can ask the map to show in red all the water points that aren't functioning. I take this to the UN. The UN then says, this isn't right. We're in control of all of this. We're in charge and we know exactly what's going on. I say to Mr. UN water man, who will I believe? Will I believe 1,500 people in the community whose lives depends on water? Or will I believe you sitting in an office in Kampala? You tell me. So these create disruption, but the point of them is to bring people to account, to help them up their game and collaborate with them. We're not here to challenge people. We're here to include them in this system. And the maps go on to 
the portal. So all of the different NGOs working in that part of the world can look at this portal and question the map for themselves if they want to see whether the water's turbid or whether where they should put those school desks that have just been no, uh, donated. We have massive classrooms with no school desks in them, for instance. We all know the tragedies that go on there. We can use the map for outbreaks, so we could colour green all of the Ebola um, the Ebola suspected, and in red, all of the Ebola confirmed. On this map, you see that happening in West Africa, where we, uh, where we worked a lot in this motorcycle mapping technique to round up Ebola and get it under control. Epidemiologists love, I'll say that again, epidemiologists, they love mapping because they can see the behavior of a disease. And when pit populations move around because of cattle camp or because they're going to market, the disease starts to accommodate and adjust. It's really weird sometimes to see a disease adopting characteristics, adaptive characteristics. So there's a real science in this, but you're involving those rural village chiefs in that science. It's a kind of really fascinating world of very, as I said at the beginning, a very visceral output for a very digital project. We also work with clan chiefs in northern Uganda. So they're fighting the Ministry of Lands, who are trying to tell them, oh, you, you had that land and now you don't. Here we've got some plots that are actually refugee plots, but the clan chiefs can put down their ancestral grounds on OpenStreetMap. It has no, no precedence over the official. OpenStreetMap can accommodate both amounts. This is a sustainable disaster solution for all sorts of things. Um, it's being taken on by the, the next national census in Uganda. We're hoping to support them through this. It's not a small thing and it's not a game, although it is the background for certain geographic uh, role-play games that I could mention. But it gets used here in the next nas national census. This is the U Uganda Bureau of Statistics offices who've identified this as a participatory, cheap, effective and accurate way to do their nas national census. Here we see North America, but this isn't the map that we're used to. These are the tribal territories of the First Nations in North America. So there are thousands of points that have gone on there. We see an alternative to the map that we're used to. And this is something that gives that map its voice. Now, what I'm proposing for us, we can see a slide here when we go in, in tight. This is Sierra Leone. And in Sierra Leone, we take these surveys on these mobile phones, on motorbikes, and we ask the, the question of all of the boreholes and the villages and who's there and how many people... And some villages have the same name. So we say, what's the meaning of the name of your village? What's the meaning of the name? And so we can ask the map, show us all those meaning questions. And we see a map come about where we have. There was a great warrior called Kui who named this town Kuiva, the village of drunkards, as you can see. It's, so towns are named after these things. It helps us to disambiguate. But it's something that we can use in the times when we feel a bit disempowered about the environmental issues that are going on, whether we've got any authorship or governance over where, whether we're part of bigger uh, land masses, all sorts of uh, ways in which we ourselves feel excluded. This is open and free to everybody. The Africans are miles ahead of us. We need to get on board. Here's an environmental justice map. This is all using OpenStreetMap. Around the world, you can click on different points and see where there's a coal mine and the people are being exploited. There are sweatshops. There are, there are different things. And uh, I encourage you to go to this EJ Environmental Justice Atlas. So the point is the map can be adapted for all of our needs. Um, and it's something of which we can take authorship. It's a call to action. And uh, I'm here to propose that we start to understand it for what it is and respond. Thank you.